facilitator of this panel. We have four panelists and a commentator. The name of this panel is Changing Society, Why We Must and How We Can. And basically the question we're going to deal with is why we feel capitalists cannot be reformed, what, what we want, and a little about our perspectives, what's the framework we feel most useful in understanding what's going on. We hope to have a lot of discussion both among ourselves and with people here. We don't see this as a you know an hour and a half lecture. We have for 12, 30. Each of the panelists is going to go from 10 to 15 minutes. Then uh, Charlie Justice here is going to be talking a little bit about questions to raise for the audience as a whole, and then we'll open it up. So our first panelist, I'll introduce each of them as they go. Our first panelist is Adam Sanchez, and that lives in Portland from the International Socialist Organization, ISO. And I'll tell you, everybody's two minutes left to go. All right, great. So I think the current economic crisis has really gotten rid of the fiction that there's some sort of iron wall between politics and economics. You know, for decades, neoliberals fought to liberate the capitalist system from the meddling of governments and bureaucrats. Uh, but when the banks began collapsing, Wall Street and its friends in Washington dropped their anti-government idea like a hot potato. Uh, Treasury Secretary and ex-Goldman Sachs CEO Henry Paulson led the charge, followed by his successor, Timothy Geithner, uh, who have now put U.S. taxpayers on hook for somewhere around $13 trillion uh, in government payouts or guarantees to banks and other institutions, uh, a figure that's roughly uh, equivalent to the U.S.'s annual gross domestic product. Uh, this about face really destroyed the last vestiges uh, of the consensus in favor of an unfettered free market uh, among large sections of the business and political elite. Uh, no less than ex-Federal Reserve Alan Chairman, right? You know, they used to call him the, ma the maestro by his adoring fans, right? And, and his supposed genius for orchestrating uh, the economy. Uh, he admitted in October that he found a flaw in his ultra-libertarian uh, free market faith that had led to the housing bubble and the subsequent crash. Uh, to top it all off, General Motors, uh, once the quintessential industrial powerhouse synonymous with U.S. capitalism worldwide, has now gone bankrupt, taken over by the government. Uh, this has led to the recognition that the economy is just as political as gay marriage. Uh, that is, there is no invisible hand that manages the economy uh, while voters and politicians decide social issues, uh, abortion, environmental protection, etc. Uh, all of it is political and all of it is related. Fortunately, I think Obama's election represents a renewed interest in politics at an important time. Uh, the question is, how do we restructure our society to meet the needs of the vast majority of humanity and rid the planet of the scourges of war, exploitation, and oppression? Uh, I'm going to argue that socialism, a society based on workers' control and dedicated to meeting human needs, is the alternative that we urgently need. Um, now, it's interesting talking about socialism in a time like this because, you know, you have the, the right-wing blowhards, you know, I mean, even in the campaign, John McCain and Palin, you know, were throwing socialism at Obama. Obama's a socialist, right? And actually, I mean, they, they, that was a service to us socialists. They repopularized the term. What they didn't, they didn't know was people, oh, Obama's a socialist. Well, maybe I'll check out what that is. Uh, and, and actually, you, you'll notice the right-wing uh, talk radio now starts as going fascist, you know, or, or whatever thing they can couple, come up with because they realize that actually didn't work. Um, you know, Newsweek, people probably see, we are all socialists now, right? This, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans taking hand to uh, uh, bail out the banks on the, the workers' expense. So they have a, uh, in this issue, there's why there won't be a revolution. Americans might get angry sometimes, but we don't hate the rich. Uh, we prefer to laugh at them, and that's next to a, a picture of uh, Donald Trump and what it looks like to be a gold-plated broom. Uh, so, you know, of course, all this really confuses uh, and skews what socialism actually is, uh, because for most of the 20th century, the main examples uh, that people have had of something calling itself socialism have been one of two things, either some form of Stalinism, like Castro's Cuba, Mao's China, or Stalin's Russia, uh, or some form of social, social democracy, parliamentary socialism, i.e., vote for me, the socialist, uh, candidate to get elected to office uh, like they might have in France or 
European countries where you have large socialist parties that get elected, maybe even uh, hold the highest office of the state. Uh, there's an American socialist uh, by the name of Hal Draper who argued back in the 60s uh, that there are two strains of socialism, two souls of socialism was his pamphlet, uh, and that Stalinism uh, and social democracy were actually variants of the same soul. That is the soul of socialism from above. Uh, some either heroic guerrilla leader or some Stalinist bureaucrat or some parliamentary official doing it on your behalf. Uh, he argued also that there was another soul, which is the soul of Marx's Marxism, uh, which is the soul of socialism from below. Uh, and Marx and Engels were very clear that they were not just statists. Uh, uh, Engels said, we are not among those communists who are out to destroy personal liberty, uh, who wish to turn the world into one huge barrack uh, or into a gigantic workhouse. Uh, and here Engels could have been speaking directly to Joseph Stalin, right? He goes on to say, we have no desire to exchange freedom for equality. We are convinced that in no social order will personal freedom be so assured as in a society based on communal ownership. Uh, Marx and Engels wrote a pamphlet called The Poverty of Philosophy, uh, in which, in part, they ridiculed the idea uh, simply state ownership would equal socialism. And Engels joked, uh, the Austrian Chancellor uh, Metternich or Napoleon would be among the founders of socialism because they nationalized the tobacco industry. Uh, you know, I, I'm you know going to have to skip out early to take a test to be a high school teacher. Uh, you know, and the idea that you know high school teachers technically work for the state, right? You know, uh, and and this idea we have workers' power, right, in, in education because we're, we're we work for the state. I wish, right? You know, even if the state controls a workplace or an industry, doesn't mean that it's socialistic because you still op you're still operating in a market system, and more importantly, the workers aren't in control of that state. Uh, Marx and Engels were very clear that socialism can't be established by a few political leaders or an enlightened minority. Uh, Marx argued that socialism must be the self-emancipation of the working class. The opening pages of the Communist Manifesto, uh, they argue society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other. Bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, and proletariat, the working class. And if you actually look at the Marxist definition of the working class, those that sell their mental and physical energy for a wage, uh, this statement has never been more true. It includes roughly 70% of the U.S. population and 2.4 billion people worldwide, clearly one of the largest single blocks of humanity. Um, the bourgeoisie controls society through their ownership of the means of production, the means of producing society's wealth. Workers have no choice but to work for one or another boss. Capitalists generate profit through exploitation of workers, squeezing more and more productivity, even as, in, as is the case today, uh, when they are being paid less for it. Furthermore, uh, we, have, we have no say uh, over what we produce or how we produce it. Uh, Marx pointed out that the despotism of capital uh, in the workplace demonstrates just how little real democracy uh, actually exists in our society. Uh, but workers aren't just victims, right? The power of the working class is our ability to withhold our labor. Uh, when workers go on strike, they demonstrate how much capitalists actually depend on them. Without workers, nothing can be produced. Kids can't be taught, subway systems won't run, uh, no products can be delivered to Walmart, the sick can't be treated, etc. Uh, the ability to take collective action gives workers the potential power to take control over the economy and reorganize society based on our needs. But it's not quite as simple as that. Collective struggle requires conscious political engagement in a battle of ideas to overcome individual isolation, fragmentation and division such as racism and sexism, uh, it, which capitalism fosters in the working class. Uh, the tremendous struggles of workers in the 1930s, which Obama loved to reference uh, during his campaign, uh, are a powerful example of how the working class uh, has organized collectively on a mass scale uh, and successfully fought for change. Uh, however, we don't really need to go back that far uh, to find examples of workers' power. May Day, 2006, right? Immigrant workers across the country marched to challenge scapegoating and demand legalization. Uh, what effectively was a Latino general strike uh, beat back reactionary <coughs> legislation and a national movement for immigrants' rights erupted all over the country. 
that day, I think, stands as a powerful example of how much the U.S. economy depends on immigrant workers and, by extension, all workers.